Hello. Hi. Uh, OK. I hope everybody's got lunch. And uh, we'll start and move into the second half of the day, which is um, the way we uh, broke it up is that the first half of the morning is the technical, is the more design focused talks. And the second half of the day is slightly more technical. We go into a little bit more detail on specific techniques that you can use. So Akash has been desperately trying to erase the phrase, that web security guy, from the internet with little success. But he's that web security guy. And um, he's going to talk about how you can tell uh, over the next 45 minutes whether you're designing an insecure site. So uh, he wants to, uh, he, he's a co-founder and the manager for uh, the OWASP Bangalore and the open security com community, which is called Null. So perhaps if you're interested in issues around security, connect with him afterwards as well. Uh, also, if you were sitting at the back, there's plenty of space up front if you'd like. Uh, you're more than welcome to come up in the front and on the sides. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. See, I have a tough job. You know, you just had good lunch. So I need you to be like awake, at least vocal, so you can like, keep your eyes closed. And whenever I'm shouting a bit, you can just reply then. Can you do that? Yes, no, maybe. Yes, no, maybe. OK, the first row is awake, mostly because these are people I know, and I've dragged them to the talk. I don't want them waiting outside. OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, how to tell if you're designing an insecure website. First of all, the first uh, thing you should know about, it's not a how-to. The reason is because uh, apparently Hasgeek doesn't allow how-to sessions. It's very clearly written on the proposal page of Meta Refresh. I got in. OK, my, my proposal uh, title started with a how-to, and I still got in. So maybe they're not paying that much attention. And does that bother you? Oh, yes. Yes. How many? Can you raise your hands? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> so <laughs> the only reason it's there is because I wanted to see if you're awake. But there is a subtle uh, uh, point to that. Uh, my talk is less about design from a designer's point of view, but more about how I experience it and how you know it comes in my way, because I do uh, application security day in and day out, and how it always comes in my way. Okay, from from creating secure products. And you know, if you've heard this before, security versus usability and you know, business case and all of that, that's fine. Like grammar irks you. Like my friend Ashish just said, it irks you when you see your being used. Right? Sometimes design comes in the way of security. My point is that it need not be. It's possible that using design, you can develop in a more secure manner, or it could be more secure for your end users. Whatever the objectives are, what we'll you know, do, you know, we'll go through it and we'll see. First, I have to tell you a joke. This is the second thing I have to make sure that you stay awake. So, you know, we all have our uh, favorite websites. Right, uh, some websites that we maybe log into every day. I use Reddit a lot. I'm sure a bunch of you do that, or maybe Facebook, which is very common because all your friends are there. So I had a favorite website. Right, it used to be called Dig. Anyone's heard of Dig here? Wow, cool. <laughs> they are raising their hands on their own. Great. So, so that's behavioral whatever at work. So uh, I used to go to dig, and then you know, I discovered something else, Reddit, or maybe something else. There's pop URLs. And I started going to that website. 
So it was like it, it had been three months, three and a half, four months. And I remembered, oh, I used to go to dig and you know, there were there were some some pool links there. Let me go and see what it's up to. So I type dig.com in my browser, I go there, and suddenly this pop-up opens, okay? We've all seen pop-ups, they're very irritating. And the pop-up is the website talking to me. And Dig is like, so where have you been? Right? Give me all like this, these passive aggressive vibes. Um, like, okay, what? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been around, I've, got, I've been busy, I've been going to other websites, and oh, okay, are those websites nicer to look at? <laughs> Do they load faster? Do they have better typography? And I'm not really sure what is happening, OK? I don't expect the websites to have attitude, right? They're like just static things, even when they're dynamic. But that is an example of an insecure website. <laughs> Thank you so much. OK, now let's, let's talk about what the thing is. First of all, there's a disclaimer. I always put disclaimers for uh, Hasgi conferences because uh, you tend to be very opinionated, and uh, I tend to be a little controversial. I keep teasing people, so you know the disclaimer comes first. I understand things about insecure websites, right? I don't really understand design UI UX uh, that much. And uh, the case in point, I was sitting in the second row. And during this talk about overexposed, this uh, person was, uh, I think Sawek was mentioning uh, how it's, he changes the font a bit and it looks nicer. And he was talking about serif and sans serif. And I turned to Mrinal, a good friend who really likes to talk about typography and other things. Uh, so what is the difference between sans and sans serif? And uh, he says, what do you think is the difference? I thought serif is where you have cursive writing, and sans serif is when you ha don't have cursive writing. Apparently, that's not true. Anyone else who doesn't know the difference? Anyone else like me? OK, wrong audio. Oh, there, there are two people. Great. Four. So apparently, <laughs> serif is the one which has a dash above the L and the P and all that. And in sans serif, that's not the case. And Times New Roman is a really bad font to use online. That's what I got of that, OK? So clear disclaimer, you understand what I'm saying? This is not a how-to. This is more like a series of thoughts. OK, any more spelling mistakes are mine. OK, it's not intentional. So just point it out. What I'm going to talk about is effective design. OK, I will tell you what I think is effective design. Oh, it could be UI, UX. For me, it's the same. You know, I, I, sorry, I'm not from this uh, background. So designer, UI expert, UX expert, all the three things are same to me. Obviously, it's not. <laughs> I understand there are differences, but I personally don't care. I, <laughs> when I see ClearTrip, I see uh, that's a really nicely uh, done website. And you know, I definitely appreciate it before, you know, compared to uh, Make My Trip or Go iBibo or one of those. But in the end, if GoIBibo or some other website is offering a cheaper flight, <laughs> so for me, that's effective design. <laughs> so this is what I think effective design is. You may disagree with me, but we'll take the disagreement outside <laughs> after the talk is over. Something that compels a user to do what the designer wanted. It may not be perfect, you know, it may have missed a lot of edge cases, it may have missed the main point, but I think from an end user point of view, right? I'm a consumer of design. I don't produce design, but I'm a consumer. It's like uh, when I showed the slides to Mrinal, uh, I was like, can you fix the typography? And he like, took, looked at two slides and he was like, sorry, dude, <laughs> this can't be done. But whatever. So I'm saying that something that compels a user to do what the designer wanted. OK, let's, let's stay with that thought. I think Gmail is a great example of effective design. And I'll tell you why. Personally, I did not know that you could 
arrange mails in labels rather than physical folders. Gmail taught me that. Maybe it was, a, it was not a new idea, it was not unique to Gmail, but that's where I experienced it. OK? So same uh, uh, thought that effective design is Gmail. But let's look at a closer look at an example. Can you notice, I don't know if you can read this, obviously last benchers can't, but the URL seems different. Can you guys read that? Yes, no, maybe? So is it a phishing attack or an effective design? In this case, this is just a demonstration. It's like a proof of concept for a phishing attack. Why? OK, I had a nice animation. Yeah, that's it. It's pointing. The arrow is pointing to the URL. What I'm saying is a well-executed phishing attack. I'll explain what phishing attack is you know, a couple of times later. Is is an example of effective design. What is the objective of the attack? To steal credentials. Or do something else, maybe you know, post on your wall or something. But it is an effective design because the way web design works and how consumers consume it, there are a few things okay, which are common here. We're looking at a, you know, just trying to see what is that that looks, makes it a phishing attack. First of all, there's a favicon, okay, which says it looks like that uh, red folder, which is like a Gmail thing. And uh, when you drag it and save it in your bookmarks, it looks like the Gmail favicon, right? And whenever you bookmark something, you will not check the URL it is going to every time. Makes sense because that's why you bookmark it to save time. Yes, no, maybe. Cool. So this is phishing with a fur, not f fur. There is a whole history behind why it's phishing with a fur because of freaking and all that. We'll not get into that. I believe, from my personal experience, there are some features of effective design. Okay. I might have missed a lot, but let me stick to these for now. There are some assumptions about how the site should be laid out, what it should contain, based on some things like heat maps. And there are a bunch of other data-driven things that Google does very well with your A and B testing and other things. There is always call to action. Sometimes it's a green big button. Uh, nowadays, you know, you have these new uh, frameworks for uh, websites called Zurb Foundation and Bootstrap and all the others, and they, you know, tell you it's a feature that they have nice responsive buttons because buttons which like go big and small based on the size of the uh, screen. There are some visual cues, right? And this is more relevant to anyone who does uh, shopping online. There are a bunch of websites which very proudly proclaim why they should be trusted. Right? Because they have logos about uh, Better Business Bureau, E-Trust, N-Trust, bunch of things. In the end, it's just an image, and it's a visual cue. How does phishing work? Most people, now not the people sitting in this room, okay, most people don't waste an entire Friday sitting in a room talking about UI and UX. <laughs> They're mostly in office right now. They will finish at 5 and go drink or something. <laughs> right? So you are not most people. Think about people in your lives who are not into tech. Your parents, maybe your siblings. Most people do not pay attention to what is in the address bar. Right? So I, I completely agree with Sovik's point about having really good looking URLs. But you know what? Most people don't really care. It's not an attitude thing. It's, it's not an attitude thing. It's, it's like, uh, I remember email addresses better than full names. Why? Because growing up, that just made sense. Bunch of you, I wouldn't know your first name, but I would know your Twitter ID. Right? So that's what happens. That, you know, this is the, uh, the function of the crowd you, or uh, company you keep. The second thing is, people love to fill login forms. 
they see a login form and they know, oh, I know this. <laughs> yeah. Because this is what an address bar can really look like. Wow, your eyes will bleed. I'm telling you, your eyes will bleed. It say, starts with scheme, colon, two slashes. Then you can actually have a login, colon, password, at host name or host address, which means a website name or an IP address, colon, port number. OK, and a bunch of other things. Hier hierarchical paths to the resource, then question mark and your parameters. And uh, all of you who are into like backbone.js and all, your fragment ID. Right? That's what you end up doing. How do you uh, bookmark stuff and all? Uh, I've just taken this from the browser security handbook. So if you look at the URL for the reference, which is HTTP colon slash slash a domain name slash a hierarchical path to the resource, right? Most likely uh, it's, it's multiple folders, but it need not be, right? You have your routers and everything else. So I was trying to research for this talk and I kind of figured out this is an important book for anyone who's doing web design and you know talking about usability. There used to be this guy, uh, Jacob Nielsen or something. He had a blog called Use It, right? Yeah, I'm, I, I don't know if he's like in, in, in the fashion anymore or not. <laughs> because there are a bunch of other people, right? Because apparently Amazon uh, says this is like a more popular book. Uh, it's a very cool title, Don't Make Me Think. And, and that big browser button, you know, the call to action, and conveniently placed cursor. Maybe. This is my thought. Don't think equals impulsive. Why would that be? Because impulsive is acting or done without forethought. Young impulsive teenagers, that was the original uh, meaning I got from Google, but it could be shoppers. A lot about usability, you know, a lot of research is driven by how can we get people to shop more? Not leave them, you know, where they've filled in their shopping cart but they don't do the last thing. A lot of it is about landing pages and conversion rates, right? So the design is driving people to be impulsive. They're saying effective design is, what is the conversion rate? What is data-driven design all about, right? What is A and B testing all about? But people rely on visual cues. We come back to phishing. So if anyone doesn't know what it is, <laughs> it's a made up word basically. Okay, it's not a dictionary word. It's the act of attempting to acquire information such as usernames, passwords, and credit card details by masquerading as a trustworthy entity in an electronic communication. It seems like a, you know, a, a, a bureaucrat has written this definition. The part that I want, to, want you to focus on, very nicely I put it in yellow, and I made the font bigger, is trust. OK? Because I believe effective design, in the end, is about generating trust. OK? It's like if you have a post on Craigslist about the next design wave, most of you will not take it seriously. Because it's on Craigslist. You've seen the UI of Craigslist, right? But if the same thing is in a Q&A format in Quora, some of you might actually you know, upvote it. Yeah, you're being fooled. It's trust. <coughs> People trust big shiny locks. <laughs> they do, right? That's why you're laughing right now. Trust no one. Do you know which? What? OK. The X-Files, yeah, the show about alien abduction and all that. It has the best piece of advice, trust no one. And uh, uh, there are a bunch of people who I work with regularly, and they just get fed up of me saying that don't trust no one, be paranoid, do security, all of that. And they're like, yeah, whatever, right? But that's, the, that's what I'm trying to say. We cannot escape from getting better design. We cannot escape from people. You know, it being easy for people to spend more money buying stuff, 
but can we do it in a manner which is secure? I think I'll finish early. I just want to give you two examples where this trust collides with effective design. And it makes a really bad case for uh, UI and UX. The first example is a password reset or a password change feature in websites. Okay, And again, the case I'm going to make is why I think it's bad for bad UI or UX. Maybe that's not the case. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And then the second thing which I'll definitely look at is an SSL enabled website. Okay, a uh, question for you guys. Is, should it be an SSL enabled website or it should be a SSL? Why? It's an S. Ah. See, another thing I learned today. Today I learned. So, I, in an ideal world, when there were no uh, criminals, there was no try, you know, nobody trying to steal your stuff, passwords wouldn't matter, right? Nobody was trying to steal, so why would you need passwords? But in an ideal world, how a password reset thing would work? You click on enter email to reset password, or actually give me my password, it will give you your super secret password. Why does it not work like that? OK? That's what we're going to look at. When you click that button, what really happened? OK? There was some code, some source code, some JavaScript, some HTML loaded in the browser. That's why the button got generated, right? That sent an email to the server. Or maybe it filled a form. It did something. Right? It moved from the browser to the server, which is on fire. I don't know why. That, that's the graphic I have for you. Now, the server did a bunch of things. Maybe it was you know, if a sensible programmer there, someone like you. It checked if the email was actually in the database. It generated a, a password. It did something, all of that. Okay, What is wrong with this picture? Why is it bad for UI and UX? Okay, In turn, bad for security. Because the server doesn't know it is you who filled the form. The email ID that you filled in. That it actually belongs to you. Do you understand? Because you don't have the password. You've not authenticated with the server. You just got a form. You filled it. Could be any, anyone's email ID. Like someone gave an example of IRCTC where you can get the username in the error message if you put in some email ID or, or the other way around. Okay. Now, this is the difficult part. How is this securely solved? Using out-of-band communication. What does that mean? This communication is not based on the web, you know, the, the client server thing that you have just done. Most likely, the code loaded in the browser did something to the server, and the web server will email you a link, hoping that the email address is in your hands. Right? The web server is going to trust that information. It is going to email you that link. Now, the email is lying on another server. You will have to log into your email. right? You have to click on the link, and that link will take you to the server. Now, the server has the unique whatever identification it had, because it knows that it sent the link to you. Based, based on that, it confirms the link is proper, and it allows you to reset the password. OK? That's how it happens, right? Now, try explaining this to your dad. Okay, my dad, the way he uses the computer, okay, he uses one finger to type. And when he's like typing, he does not hold on the mouse. Okay, so he'll find the keys, make, make a mistake, find backspace, and does not know what tab is, so doesn't go to the next field. He then searches for the mouse, holds the mouse, searches for the cursor on the screen, then, you know, finds the exact spot where if he clicks, it'll be in the next field, and he does all this. You completely broke whatever he has learned about it. Okay? Which is why it's bad for UI and UX. But there's another twist. 
all of this was sent back and received in clear text. <coughs> clear text is text that you can read. Right? That's it. Nothing else. What's wrong with that? This is a hypothetical list of stuff that is between you in the browser and the server. Okay, you could be on a wireless network. If you, it was sent in clear text, all of you who are in the same wireless network, it is theoretically possible, it's practically very easy to see what data was being sent. There could be a helpful IT admin monitoring for bad traffic. You know, bad traffic is in quotes, so you don't know what they're monitoring for. There could be an ISP gateway with helpful IT admin. There could be a country level gateway with helpful government IT admin. Again, monitoring for bad traffic. You know, think of a bunch of countries who've done this before. There could be a server admin monitoring. And you don't know who else. How many hops are there, what routers were involved, all of that. So there are a bunch of things that can happen. And this is all sent in clear text. Just so, we, before we continue, I want to recap what we have talked about. Because I kind of forgot when I was doing this, you know, where I was. Uh, effective design inspires trust. People trust based on strong visual cues. These cues can be faked. I gave you an example of uh, a phishing page. Idly don't trust anyone. You guys won't listen to me. If we use common sense approach to generating a new password, we will need to trust multiple intermediaries. I always wanted to use that word. It's very difficult to pronounce. Right? So this is what we have looked at so far. And we now know that it is going in clear text. It is, you know, maybe readable by a bunch of people who may not be very friendly to you. This is a problem worthy of a philosopher after. So how do we crea uh, create secure websites? Nobody gets the meme? I thought it was fun funny. SSL. Ever heard of this? SSL? HTTPS? Yes, some people are nodding. OK. Uh, sorry. sorry about that. There was a time when uh, people used to think that all problems in application security will be magically solved by SSL. OK? Did it not turn red or something? OK. I put that animation in it. OK? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Let's see. This is what SSL looks like to a normal user who's using a browser. OK? This is not my slide. I've taken it from a place. I've referenced it. If you were using Chrome, that shiny lock will be on the left. If you're using i9, it'll be on the right. Opera has a different place. Safari has a different place. And uh, I'm sure there are a bunch of browsers missing here. And I'm not even looking at the mobile browsers. OK? This is supposed to you know, give you some security. But the way, and I'm not saying you know, designers are at fault or something. But the way it and looks like to an end user, these things appear everywhere. And there have been attacks against SSL where they have just created a shiny lock, put it on as part of the web page. They can't manipulate what's on the, you know, the, the Chrome or the browser, right? But they can put it on the web page, and people trust those things. There are two things the SSL is supposed to do, OK? Without being too technical, idly nobody can see your message. Therefore, they can't change it, because they can't really see what is in clear text. And are you talking to the right server? Your encryption doesn't really count for anything if it, re if it is reaching the wrong server, because there, it is going to get decrypted. And then there is this hierarchy. You are supposed to trust some intermediate CAs. CAs are certification authorities. Let's just leave it at that. You are supposed to trust some third parties and who have been assigned and who have done business with the root CAs. So root CAs have a business. They have sold something to these middle guys, and you're supposed to trust them. 
to tell you that the server you're talking to is your actual bank. What could go wrong? Bad things can happen. Uh, there are a bunch of examples. The point is hundreds of certi certificates for different websites have been generated which your browser will completely accept as genuine, authentic, and you wouldn't get the, the, you know, the dreadful red page warning that are you sure you want to continue. I'm sure you guys have seen that, right? This is what a rogue SSL certificate can look like. This was done as part of a research project. These guys created a certificate and they called it, I broke the internet and all I got was this t-shirt. They never released this because they thought that was, this was too sensitive to be released. But uh, this research is available. It will be part of the slides. So you can have a look. So then, you know how businesses respond to a, to a challenge? They came up with something called EVSSL. Extended Validation SSL. They would only give this SSL certificate to a genuine business. Right? That's what they're saying. Makes you wonder who were they selling it to earlier. This is, this, there's a lawyer involved and he's going to make sure that the, the business address is checked or whatever, but that's what it came to. But look what happened to that. This is how it appears to an end user. If you're in I, the whole bar is green. Because PayPal is using an EV certificate, extended validation. <coughs> On Chrome and Firefox, just a small part in the left is green. But end users mostly don't notice address bars. Right? They're not even looking at this. Uh, <laughs> Firefox also does one, one other thing. It's a subtle thing. I don't know if you noticed. If you notice, the, the actual domain part is, in, is, is like darker than where it says HTTPS colon slash slash www. OK? So that is trying to show you the actual domain. Like, you know, people really cared about it. I don't have time to cover this. I actually promised th three things. So maybe next year. I don't have the answers for you. I really don't have the answers, okay? I don't understand design that much. But I'm guessing, I'm hoping that being in this room, talking to this audience, you guys will look at these things as well, right? Because a, a secure, safe internet basically means more business for you, right, in the end? And uh, I don't understand uh, the design part of it, okay? I, I understand security. I also understand that people want to use these things without worrying about security, insecurity, how safe, how paranoid. They don't care about all that. Okay? The idea is to get your attention and see if these problems can be solved using design. Because it's a very powerful tool. I think before ClearTrip, we didn't really have good travel websites. You know, it's, it's actually really beautiful to look at, right? Even the way the ticket gets printed and all that. That's all I have. Questions? I'm on time. Questions? Okay. Till someone figures out they want to ask a question. I just want to tell you a nice story. Uh, I went to a KSRTC booking office. KSRTC is your bus roadways. And there was this really nice person sitting there managing the ticket uh, thing. He had Chrome open on his computer. I was really impressed. And this is like three years back. So I said, I have to book a ticket. You know what he did? In the Chrome bar, he typed in www.google.com. Then pressed Enter. Then it went to google.com. Actually, went to co.in. And then it showed the search bar. There, he, in all caps, he typed KSRTC. Then pressed Enter. And then clicked on the first link, search link returned, to go to the KSRTC website. The KSRTC website is ksrtc.co.in. That's what normal people do. Questions? Was it so fabulous that there are no questions? All the plants, ask your question now.
Yeah, it's not really a question, but it's an anecdote. Um, you know how the modern browsers have they have different colors for the security locks? Like it can be red or green or yellow. Yeah. I got the most concerned call from my mom when she was on Gmail once, and it was yellow. And because it was loading assets from an insecure website, yeah. and she was like, oh my god, my website's hacked, my computer's hacked, oh god. And like, boy, she freaked out and she like took a computer into like a hardware store and boy, and it's just like, I tried to explain to it, not something to worry about. <laughs> I, I didn't have any luck. <laughs> but that's yeah. the problem, right? Uh, you can say, don't worry about it this time, but yeah. next time it could, it could be a genuine threat. Yeah. It just confuses a, a normal users. Yeah. So some Any other questions? Think about. Hi Akash. How Hi. do you? Uh, what do you think is the uh, security requirement for intranet applications within the corporate? Which are not the accessed the office. by public, yeah. How much importance should we give there and how much we should not? If you're asking me, they should be built with the same security requirements as you would build uh, any other kind of application. Because uh, intranets tend to store a lot of sensitive data. And uh, in fact, I'm doing a training uh, next week where one of the tasks will be to get access to an intranet application from outside and steal data. Okay, so if you're asking me, you should definitely consider it at par. Anything else? Uh, this isn't a question, but uh, his anecdote reminded me of another thing. So uh, I used to work at Practo, which is a medical startup here based in Bangalore. And one of the changes that the design team did there was that in the search bar of the website, of the internal application that the doctors and nurses actually use, in the search box, they put in a hint text that said search. Okay. And the next day we received 13 phone calls from clinics across the country that there's already something written inside the box. How do I search? Yes. So if people think that, you know, I mean, people, uh, a lot of people come up and discuss things like, you know, there should be hint texts and labels and stuff. This yeah, is and if something it's not very even funny, it's like my parents just get anxious when they're yeah. unable to figure out. It causes them so much anxiety, like they have broken something there. Anything else? Oh, yeah, there's a question there, the back. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Surud. I'm a designer. Uh, we're discussing a problem uh, to which the way I see it, you're saying it has a design solution, or does it have a tech solution? What is the point of your talk? The point is that without really good design, none of the tech solutions will work. I don't have an answer that what would be a good design, but I'm saying the current situation is that we have a lot of security issues, but the design isn't really helping us out. Does that answer? Uh, I, don't, I don't really follow. Uh, I don't have so I'm saying uh, even yeah. phishing websites are made as well, as pretty as say regular websites. No, so it's, it, they're, they're just copying the entire source sure, code and then sure. they're set up. So from a uh, user standpoint, both look equally secure, right? So from a design perspective, they've got it covered. So shouldn't so the tech get stronger for authentic websites? Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, I gave you an example of a phishing website of Gmail, where in the address bar it clearly shows that it's not Gmail, right? Now the extended validation SSL, which is a solution for SSL's failings, is doing everything in, in its power to put all of the visual cues inside the address bar. I don't believe that's a good solution. I don't know what is a good solution, but I don't believe that's a good solution. Because people, normal people are no, uh, not paying attention to the address bar in the first place. That's what I'm trying to say. And I, this is the exact discussion that I'm hoping for. Right? Uh, answers from you guys. All right. Thanks. Hi. Uh, do you think if browsers actually become smart enough to recognize the comparison between the actual page and the URL is different? So if a browser recognizes a Gmail page and sees the URL is different from a Gmail authenticated URL which it has in the system, 
it can create an alert for this, not show the website. See, uh, the problem will it not be solved. Basically, the problem will not be solved by the browser vendors because if they try to start reading what is happening and start comparing and sending it to somewhere else, it will become a huge privacy issue. No, no, no. Do you have your no, no, no. Microsoft Site Advisor and bunch of uh, sorry, uh, McAfee Site Advisor trying to do something similar. The other thing like Chrome can do, Google Chrome does, is by default for some of the websites, uh, it, it has the uh, certificates already in the browser. Okay. Right? So by default, you can't go wrong. You can't go to a wrong server. The idea is that let's just take it away from the user to choose that because I, I they think, want to I go think, to PayPal. I think you did not uh, get, maybe I was not proper in that. I, I'm maybe sorry, I was I, not proper in explaining what I was trying to say was, so normally what browsers nowadays show is a snapshot in the uh, home page where you can actually see a small uh, image of the site which you normally go to. Yeah. So uh, what a browser maybe can do is uh, keep a snapshot and let's say uh, as an image and when a uh, phishing site loads up, so the URL will be different as you said. So take a snapshot of that phishing site and compare if there's some, uh, some, some basic uh, similarity algorithms can run on it and compare that a similar UI but the your source, the URL resource, is actually not the right one. It can say a problem is there. Yeah, so where will the uh, comparison data be kept? In the browser. OK, that's a solution. Maybe, I don't know if that's uh, viable. It's just. But that makes sense. What changed. you're saying makes sense, yeah. I think there was a question here. Someone? Oh, sorry. So uh, one of the things is, I, I think there's a design problem to security, but I think there's a a uh, problem from the security side as well in in the sense that it's very hard for a small startup to make their website reliably secure um, i think I don't agree with that at all. Uh, there are technical challenges to get ssl right the whole mixed content warnings and all that stuff i think it's it's kind of it's it's easy but it's not that easy that anyone can be secure by default it's i think it's more we'll like businesses realize that their end users don't really care so for startups, it's very important where they will put their money in, mm -hmm. right? And, and at, at a business level, the problem is solved. They don't care. Like how banks solve it, they know that 10% or 15% of the, uh, the transaction that will happen, there will be fraud in it. So they buy insurance for that. <laughs> OK, but I think there still needs to be something to make it really easy for Maybe. startups. Cheaper, faster, simpler to implement. You should start coming to Null. We do a, a lot of uh, uh, information security stuff for free. And startups can benefit from that. How am I doing on time? Hello. It's not a question, really. Uh, but I think the, the bigger problem here is a uh, lot of things that we do in day-to-day -day life are uh, dependent on convention. And uh, the thing is, all with these security issues like the green bar, or the lock symbol and all, right? There is no standard convention on uh, where they would appear. Like every brow browser manufacturer would have it in different places, or they will uh, indicate it differently. So uh, the way we have web standards, uh, if we have some, you know, browser security standards, then uh, probably, you know, it will be easier for us. So the good news is they have already started doing that, especially the teams at Firefox and Chrome. They are talking about these things uh, on a regular basis, right? And they are actually working towards that. But I don't know how effective that will be, or you know, will they actually be able to get stuff done? <coughs> but but the good news is it's already started talking, okay. Okay. and including not only the browsers but some of the big websites, right? Uh, especially you know your Google, Twitter, and bunch of them also understand that how security is like a prerequisite for them providing their services well, mm. right? Which yeah. is why Facebook has started turning on. Uh, HTTPS yeah, uh, for a bunch of countries based on what happened in Tunisia. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, as you talking about the SSL, as you talking about SSL certificate. Yeah. So uh, if I am running one website and I am using the self signed certificate using the open SSL. So I, as I know, nothing is difference between the signed uh, already authorized cert CA certificate and self signed certificate. Uh, instead of just uh, we are, we are trusting on some CA, but uh, thing is internally both are showing yes. the same thing. So uh, if using that uh, self signed certificate as some uh, some of br browser don't have the root CA and CA all those certificate so anyway some site uh, still offer you have to anyway proceed to this site you have to accept 
that uh, add to exception. So if I am using on my site that certificate, self-signed certificate, and I am giving that self-signed certificate, so anyway user can proceed that certificate also. In that way we can attack using the duplicate certificate on some site. So the attack can happen, on SSL, right? Attack it it, can, it happen. can happen, but again if your users are well informed, they understand what your certificate looks but, uh, like. Some, some authorized, uh, that means uh, already CA's provided certificate also you have to anyway some, uh, it, like in India, India having the seven yes. or six cert CA's, from the, I think in uh, IE or Mozilla and Chrome, anyone don't have None it. of them have it, yeah. Yeah. So you have to, Indian guy have to anyway add the exception in browser. So if I'm providing that uh, open SSL certificate, in that case you also have to add that certificate. So you don't know, I mean you are adding that open SSL certificate or that CA certificate. So how can you prevent from this kind of attack on SSL? You can't. A in any which way you will have to either give the key of the SSL certificate and the person can verify manually before they add it. So but you can't prevent the attack if someone is hell bent on adding a In that case sir if I am using the EV certificate, EV SSL, in that case as the EV I think as I know only they are going for manually verification of the servers and uh, whatever the cer certificate is there. So in EV certificate uh, we can somewhat we can provide a solution for SSL. No, I don't think your browser will accept a self-signed certificate as an extended validation. I don't think that's possible. But I'm not sure. I'll check up on that. Okay. I, I will let you know. Uh, just meet me outside. But I don't think the browser will accept it. Akash. Akash. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to contribute to the discussion. Um, but I think uh, design teams and security teams are completely disconnected. I don't know of any design team that has security as an end goal. Um, so I think the point you were trying to get at was really that designers should get involved with this discussion of how to secure things uh, to maybe solve some of these problems. Because at right now, we're just completely disconnected people. Because if um, they did uh, uh, talk a lot more. Maybe we could solve some yeah. of this, right? It yeah. wouldn't be so bad. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have a quick break. Uh, since we've gone a little bit beyond, let's take...